My name is Elizabeth DeBrule. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at the New Hampshire Historical Society. Uh, I'm also the Director of an initiative called the Democracy Project. Um, and I to, the perspective I'm bringing to this panel is about social studies education and the way we're educating our youths in New Hampshire um, right now, today. We work with about 10,000 New Hampshire school kids a year. So we noticed a few years ago um, a real difference in the kids as they came to see us on their annual field trip. Um, we noticed that the kids didn't really seem to have the kind of basic knowledge that we had seen in years past, or decades past, about the way our government worked, about um, the way society worked, about, about our history. And what we found after about two or three years of a pretty serious investigation into this uh, is that social studies is really severely in decline in New Hampshire schools. And I would say at the elementary level, it is almost not taught anymore. The social studies that has been taught at the elementary level is very spotty. It's very dependent on individual teachers and their interests. Um, and schools in general have relegated it. Um, in some cases, it even comes lower on the totem pole than uh, PE, arts, and music. And we're hearing from high school teachers that now they are starting to have to start their social studies education, their history courses, really at ground zero, with kids coming in with just no knowledge or background of, of anything before their own lifetimes, and sometimes not even in the early years of their own lifetimes. Um, it really shocked us. It, it really caused the Historical Society to take a good, long look at how the state was doing this and where we could make the biggest difference. And one of the ways that this has come up, which is particularly relevant to this panel, is it means that kids only learn about the institution of slavery at a middle school level. They never come back to it. They never really get beyond just the basic introduction. Um, and that's going to have enormous consequences for what they understand about the impact slavery has had on this country. Lots of teachers are interested in helping kids understand what's going on in the world today, but they, they worry that parents are going to get upset, they're going to get in trouble, they're going to lose their jobs um, if they bring up topics that are too controversial. History allows us a little bit of perspective, a little bit of distance, when maybe we can look at these topics differently. Immigration is a great example of that. Um, immigration, if, if you try and talk about immigration in schools today, it's the third rail. You're really going to find yourself in trouble. But if you talk about immigration in the 19th century and that Irish and Italians were, and French Canadians were discriminated against for their religion, it helps you sort of subtly draw the parallels to what's going on today. In 1847, the Boston School Committee refused to admit Sarah Roberts, an African-American girl about five years old. They refused to admit her to the public primary school closest to her home, which at that point was all white. There was a separate school for African-American children that Sarah could attend if she wanted, and that school is called the Smith School. A year later, her father, Benjamin Roberts, sued the city of Boston for denying Sarah the right to attend the public school closest to her home. Benjamin hired Robert Morris, who's seen here. He's the first African-American trial lawyer in the United States, and he practiced in Massachusetts for decades. Um, he's a bit, got a very interesting history. So he sues the city of Boston on behalf of Benjamin Roberts, um, and Charles Sumner was also part of the case as well. It wound its way through the courts, eventually reaching the Massachusetts Judicial Supreme Court. In 1850, Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw said that the Boston School Committee had not violated any principle of equality in as much as they have provided a school with competent instructors for the colored children where they enjoy equal advantages of instruction with those enjoyed by white children. And you can see here in another excerpt from the decision of 1850 um, that the court is saying that there's a separate school, right, set apart, but it is on par with the white public schools. It's well conducted, well fitted, it's as the other separate schools. And so what I think what we can see in this language is that the doctrine of separate but equal 
was born not in the post-Civil War South, but actually in the pre-Civil War Massachusetts. In the supposedly abolitionist Massachusetts. And so separate but equal would be affirmed later in what we probably know as Plessy versus Ferguson of 1896. UCLA's Civil Rights Project um, did a study of public schools in the United States, and that study found that the most racially segregated schools are located here in the Northeast, right? Not the South, not out West, and not the Midwest, right here in the Northeast. So it's clear to me that the long history of racial segregation in this region is visible in our racially segregated public schools. African Americans in the North were turned away from the voting booth. They were thrown off public transportation. There are quite a few cases involving African American activists who were suing for um, access to public transportation. And you also have African Americans who were relegated to menial labor. Activists, including black women, men, and children, as well as their white allies, believed in the right of all children to a quality education on an equal basis. Activists vowed to take their appeal to the people themselves through petitions. And so a successful petition campaign in 1855 in Boston resulted in the enactment of legislation banning racial segregation in public schools throughout the state of Massachusetts. All right, so that was a law that was passed in 1855. I'll read a little bit of it. It said, the law forbade any distinction to be made on account of the race, color, or religious opinion of a student in the public school system. Rhode Island passed a similar law in 1866 after uh, leading their own campaign, and Connecticut as well in 1868. Um, Susan Kinstead, who's an archivist at the Portsmouth Athenaeum, uh, recently shared with me that this movement did in fact reach New Hampshire. Um, the result was different. So there was a segregated school right here in Portsmouth, the African School. Um, it operated probably in the 1820s um, and through the 1840s and early 1850s. The Portsmouth School Committee, however, debated the policy of racial exclusion in its public schools, uh, noting the experiment, as it was called, um, that had been tried in Salem, in Nantucket, and then later in Boston. But the Portsmouth School Committee decided that a separate school, um, a separate African school, was a necessity because prejudice is, quote, so strong and widespread and to undertake to stim it too soon would only expose the colored children to insult and suffering, which indeed they can hardly escape on their way to and from the present school. And so, to my knowledge, there was no um, legislation, school integration legislation passed in the state of New Hampshire. Um, I think here the committee's remarks were not wrong, right? Um, and so far as they were, there were documented incidents of abuse of black children, right, at racially integrated schools in the North. And I wanted to highlight one of those experiences um, of Josephine St. Pierre. This is an interesting recollection from her in the Boston Post in 1893. And just a little bit of context, so in 1850, um, the Boston Primary School Committee had decided that they were going to integrate their primary schools, but they did not want to integrate the grammar schools, right? There's a dis different committee that organized that. So Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin did attend an integrated primary school, but she did not have access to the grammar school. So she and her teacher came up with this plan that the teacher would instruct her at the primary school, but in advanced subjects. Because they're trying to get around segregation, they don't believe in it, um, and so she still wants that education. She refuses to go to uh, the Smith School, which is a segregated primary school. So she says, um, 
My teacher at the primary school, a dear woman, also said I should not go there, this is to the Smith School, um, and herself offered to teach me the lessons of uh, the advanced class by stealth at recess times and carried me forward with the others. Now here's the problem. There were the, the other right children saw her in that primary school, and they were thinking, well, you got held back, right? And they were teasing her for it. And she says, um, the children at the school taunted me. How could they understand why I was not allowed to go on to the higher class? That I was put back, flattened their noses against the window panes at recess time, and called me in teasing names, and branded me inward until my sensitive little heart was wounded beyond endurance. Right? So this is an, like she's you know recalling this um, while she's eight years old. And so there are memories like this from other African American girls. Um, Rachel Lyons also has a similar experience. And so when we think about people like Ruby Bridges and Linda Brown, they've um, in a lot of ways talked about their experience and the suffering that they endured trying to desegregate. Um, public schools. And my point is we have examples of this in the 19th century, right, of seven-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds who are dealing with this suffering, right, who are trying to get equal school rights. Um, but this is the effect. And I mean, I would say she's kind of bitter about it. I mean, but later on in this interview, she says, I never forgave them for what they did and for how they treated me, right? So this sticks with her even in 1893. So the stories of these children like Josephine, I think, need to be heard, they need to be told. And I think there are many more examples in this present moment, especially the children of color enduring this kind of treatment. The matter of equal school rights is urgent and unfinished. There are um, at least two cases, probably more, pending right now, um, where this question about um, education as a civil right education as a constitutional right is being asked and will be answered in case. Um, in nearby Rhode Island, there's a federal case about this, also in Michigan. And it would seem that it shouldn't really be a question because Brown v. Board um, actually enshrined equal school rights, right? Um, when the court declared that a state public edu school education is a right which must be available to all on equal terms, right? That's the language from the case. So it's really interesting that we're still debating this and we're still trying to figure out how this looks on the ground. But I would argue that if the courts fail children of color in these pending cases, it won't be the first time, right? Um, and what I'm learning from the equal school rights movement is that it's really up to the people to commit to dismantling racially segregated schools. Um, and so I'm sort of arguing for a equal school rights movement for the 21st century. And so I would love to hear your feedback and input on what that might look like and how we can draw from <coughs> these activists in the past. Thank you. The matter of school rights is urgent and not finished. Courts have failed children of color. That leaves us up, it up to us. It's our job. We're not going to do this in courts. We're not going to do it in a national level. It's our job here in our communities to make that difference. So that's one takeaway that I thought, wow, no matter what the subject, whether it's school or redlining, Rabel, you mentioned redlining, and you were the victim of that when you moved to New Hampshire. Whatever those are, we need to become better advocates at stopping. It's just stopping it. And so, speaking of stopping, all good things come to an end, like today. Thank you all for coming and being so dedicated to this, these concerns. Thank you.